Listen up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. So it's June 3rd, 2020. Uh, yesterday, June the 2nd, Ontario Premier Doug Ford said that Canada doesn't have the, quote, systemic deep roots of racism that the United States has. Um, and he also said that comparing Canada and the United States on, on that point is like comparing night and day. So the, the context was Doug Ford was asked by a reporter for his opinion on how Trump is handling the crisis in the United States. And that's how the journalists put it. They said that the crisis. So Ford started by saying uh, he doesn't have time to watch the news because he's too busy taking care of Ontario. And the full quote was, he said, thank God we're different from the United States and we don't have the systemic deep roots that they've had for years. He then said that he would come down like a ton of bricks on anyone making derogatory remarks about any minority community. And that's also an exact quote, a, a ton of bricks. I don't think anybody asked him to elaborate on what that would, would be, but that's what he said. Um, now, of course, part of this was a reaction to an appearance earlier that day by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in which Trudeau was asked for his opinion on Trump's response to the protests. And mem very memorably, it took Trudeau 21 seconds to respond, which might not sound like a lot of time, but if you watch that video, 21 seconds of dead air at a press conference is very awkward. It's painful to sit through. Um, so after the very, very, very long pause, uh, Trudeau doesn't answer the question, but instead talks about how this is a time to bring people together and listen and learn, and then affirms that there is systemic discrimination in Canada and that it's a, a lived reality for racialized Canadians. So of course, this is all some local reaction to the uprisings that have occurred across the United States since George Floyd was killed by Minneapolis police on May 25th. If you take that case on its own, it's already enraging, and it's even worse when you put it in context of this long-running systemic crisis. So here's one example. The Guardian, the British newspaper, in 2015, did a study of people killed by police across the United States. 1,134 deaths that year alone in 2015. After breaking the numbers down, the Guardian found that black people were killed by police at more than twice the rate of white people that year in 2015. And breaking the numbers down further, uh, young black men, which they define as between ages 15 and 34, they were nine times more likely than other Americans to be killed by police. Now, as for the Canadian situation, let's look at Toronto in particular for a second. The CBC did some analysis in 2018 and found there were 52 people killed in encounters with the police in Toronto from the year 2000 until 2017. Of those 52 people, 18 were black men and one was a black boy. Uh, that's 36.5% of the deaths, while black people make up 8.3% of the city's population. And then there was a report by the Ontario Human Rights Commission, which looked at the period of 2013 to 2017. And over that period, a black person in Toronto was nearly 20 times more likely than a white person in Toronto to be involved in a fatal shooting by police. Um, some more numbers from across the country. A third of all people fatally shot by the RCMP between 2007 and 2017 were indigenous. And a number from Halifax, black people in Halifax, are six times more likely to be carded than white people in Halifax. Doug Ford is wrong. It's a systemic problem in Canada. Um, the roots are deep. They go back more than just years, they go back centuries. The roots of this are European colonialism, and it's certainly a problem in Canada, not just the United States. And I think the anthropology of race and racism, which is today's topic, I think is useful in challenging some of the common misconceptions that you hear, um, including from our own elected officials, that none of this is something for Canadians to worry about, that we don't have those American-style problems here in Canada. Um, now, that isn't the topic of the whole video, but this video is a part of an Anthropology 101 course, and today's scheduled topic 
was race and racism. And there's no way, I can't do it. I can't make a video on race and racism and not talk about these current events because anthropology is the study of everyday life and for that to mean anything, it needs to include the harsh reality of right now in 2020. So my plan is to come back to that throughout the episode. Uh, but in the meantime, in a few minutes, I'm going to step away from current events a bit and get a little more theoretical. But the point of that is to use that theory to think critically about everyday life. And that will start with this first point on the, on the outline. Race isn't real, but racism is, which sounds like a paradox, but I hope it makes sense by the end of the episode anyway. Um, uh, towards that, I will present some, some key moments in the history of the concept of race. And then I'll bring the ideas of power and privilege into the conversation by looking at the similarities and the differences between stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. Um, I'll talk about racism in Canada throughout history and into the present, and this will lead up to a couple of concluding thoughts on intersectionality, which I'll say a lot more about over the next couple of episodes as well. And then um, as a sort of add-on after all this, I'll come back to what I said last episode about class. For those who did the activity of you know trying to decide what class these jobs belong to, um, I'll, I'll come back to that at the very, very end of this episode after the, the, the closing uh, credits and works cited pages. Well, we'll talk about class very briefly at the end. Here are some keywords that I won't define all at once, but the definitions come up as I go. We have race, ethnicity, systemic inequality, racism, and privilege. The big picture of this part of the series is identity and inequality. Um, and, and to review, identity is learned, personal, and social types of affiliation. So in other words, how people define the groups they belong to and or how they have that defined for them. And one point that I return to throughout these episodes is that we can't really talk meaningfully about identity without also talking about inequality because the things that make up a person's identity are the same things that shape patterns of inequality in the world today. And race is a very powerful example of that. So let's start to get to the point. Race isn't real, but racism is. Here is a definition of race from an anthropologist that I think works pretty well. Uh, race is a flawed system of classification. It's not actually based meaningfully in biology, and it uses physical characteristics to divide the human population into supposedly discrete groups. Things like skin color, hair texture, eye shape, those are some of the common ones. And as I'll explain further, in, in 2020, any anthropologist would tell you that separate so-called races of humans don't really exist. So let's contrast that with this idea, ethnicity. Ethnicity is a sense of historical, cultural, and sometimes ancestral connection to a group of people who are imagined to be distinct from those outside the group. Uh, that's just a bit of a preview. We'll, we'll say more about ethnicity a bit later. Anthropology mostly concluded about a century ago that race isn't real. But all anthropologists in 2020 would agree that racism is definitely real. And here's how one anthropologist, Kenneth Guest, defines racism. He defines it as individual thoughts and actions and institutional patterns and policies that create unequal access to power, privilege, resources, and opportunities based on imagined differences among groups. To understand where the concept of race as we know it comes from and also where patterns of racism that we see today come from, I think we need to go back to the beginnings of European colonialism, which in many ways is the root of the concept of race that is still built into the structure of our societies and is still a pretty powerful part of how many people interpret their lives and interpret the world around them. Well, here's a bit of review from the, the second episode. In the early days of European colonialism, uh, European explorers began to encounter people who looked and acted quite differently from themselves. And after returning home, they began to tell others what they saw. These descriptions were usually unfavorable, to say the least, and often they were completely false. The most extreme example of these were these imaginary monsters that I showed you in, in episode two. Over time, scientists and other educated people began working with these accounts to create frameworks of categories that they used to divide the human population. These frameworks 
usually took the form of a hierarchy of races, religions, cultures. Uh, sometimes these categories overlapped. So sometimes race and culture, for example, were seen as the same thing. Other times they were treated as separate. Uh, the specific labels and concepts were different depending on the time and the place they came from, but that's sort of the overall pattern. But what really matters for our purposes is that these frameworks always involved a hierarchy. So for centuries, every attempt to define so-called races went along with trying to rank those races in some way based on assumed natural difference in things like intelligence or attractiveness in some arbitrary way or, their, or that group of people's potential for being civilized. And nearly every time, the people doing the categorizing, of course, put their own so-called race at the top. It's an example of typological thinking, which, uh, which Kenny and Smilly define as the process of, of slotting organisms into a common category based on physical or genetic similarities and then designating it as a species or a subspecies or a race. This came from the efforts of Carl von Linnaeus, a uh, Swedish botanist who came up with, with a system for classifying plants this way. It worked pretty well with plants. The problem was they tried doing this with humans. So they looked at variations among humans and came up with categories to slot these organisms into. There were different versions of this over the years. One that lasted a long time and that still has some influence is the idea that humanity was made up of three main so-called races. And I hate even saying these words, but I'll just say them quickly. There were Caucasoids, Mongoloids, and Negroids, which translated pretty much into Europeans, Asians, and Africans. So in this view, there were these three main races. Each of them had a wide range of variation within them, but essentially you could look at any person or any group of people and tell which of the three so-called races they belonged to. Now, these categories often overlapped with a sense of evolution or unilineal cultural evolution, as we talked about in episode three, I think it was. The idea that Western Europeans were the most evolved people and everyone else was somewhere behind and might catch up someday. Um, the categories were fuzzy. They were blurry. Even at the time that they were in widespread use and most people thought they were completely scientific. But the reality is most people didn't really know what they were talking about because the categories don't make sense because they never make sense. Um, a good example from this textbook, from Stories of Culture and Place by Kenny and Smilly, their example is that, and in, in if you go back to uh, Victorian England, people there would talk about the three so-called races, Caucasoids, Mongoloids, and Negroids, those are the three races. In one moment, they would, say, they would talk about race in that sense, and then in the next moment, talk about the so-called British race. So if there are only three races, where does the British race fit in? Is, is British a, a race or like a, a sub-race, or is it a country, or is it some kind of blend of all these things? Um, nobody really knew. And I guess they weren't very good at Venn diagrams back then. But the point is, it, it didn't make sense because the categories never make sense. Um, but it was taken as common sense that the British race existed and that it was superior. And what's important to remember is the violence and the injustice that this caused. This kind of thinking is what justified slavery and colonization and genocide for centuries. So last episode... I talked about atrocities like the triangular slave trade and um, so-called Indian removal policy in the United States. I talked about how those were driven by, according to many scholars, that all that was driven by the imperatives of capitalism to constantly expand, to find new markets, and to use the cheapest labor possible. Um, and most historians would agree all of this was justified in its day by racist ideology. That's what made it possible for colonial governments, for slave traders and militaries and other powerful institutions to treat human beings like they don't matter for centuries and into the present. Many ideas that are obviously and disturbingly racist today were considered good science in their time. Some of these were even considered friendly and compassionate and helpful. A good example of that is the eugenics movement of the early 1900s. So to begin, the term eugenics was coined by Francis Galton, uh, a cousin of Charles Darwin's, incidentally. Uh, and eugenics are, was social policies that encouraged the upper classes to reproduce and discouraged marginalized groups from reproducing. So the idea was, if races exist, and people were sure back then that races did exist, and if races were formed through an evolutionary process, 
then we could keep that evolution going into the present, I guess, and make a race even better. So you could do that by using social policy to control who reproduces, which usually took the form of restricting the reproductive freedom of marginalized groups. Or in other words, trying to stop poor people, people who had done time in jail, people with addictions, people with disabilities, try to stop those people from having children. So most people, when they hear of eugenics, immediately picture Nazi Germany. And it's true that Hitler was inspired by the eugenics movement, which is why the Nazis committed mass murder against persons with dis disabilities, in addition to ethnic minorities, because it was all part of the same process of uh, so-called keeping the race pure, as the Nazis would, would put it. But it might be harder to understand that eugenics was also very influential in North America. So, for example, a number of states in the U.S., and the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta had sterilization laws, and thousands of people were surgically sterilized until the laws were finally overturned in the early 1970s. And Canada's residential schools in many ways are, are part of the same period in, in history. The eugenics movement was a significant force around the time that anthropology had pretty much given up on the idea of unilineal cultural evolution. So some of the eugenicists' main opponents were anthropologists, people like Franz Boas, who was adamant that there is no such thing as race and that all humans are equally evolved. Uh, one of the most influential works along these lines was published in 1942 called Man's Most Dangerous Myth. It's 1942, so they said man's, but we'll say human's most dangerous myth. The Fallacy of Race by Ashley Montagu, who was a student of, of Franz Boas. Um, in a nutshell, Montagu said that race is a poorly defined concept that refers to how people look. And how people look has no bearing on what their culture will look like or what they're cap capable of. Um, there's lots more to say at this point, but let's start with the point that race is poorly defined, which is kind of counterintuitive. It's, it's hard to understand because often people from the same place tend to look somewhat alike and together they tend to look pretty different from people from other places. So on one level, races are, are vague, imprecise categories based on these similarities and differences in people's appearances. Here's an example that's maybe a bit silly, but I think it helps clarify how these differences are real, but that race is a poor way to describe them. So let's say you took a plane from Western Africa to Eastern Europe. If you took that flight, you would probably notice some, some differences in the appearances of the people you saw before and after your trip. So if you look at the streets of the capital city of Cameroon and the streets of the capital city of Russia, you probably notice that it looks like most Russians look different from most Cameroonians. And you would probably notice that difference if you got on a plane in Cameroon and got off a plane in Russia. But let's say you could somehow walk. If you could do that trip on foot um, from Western Africa to Eastern Europe, you would see those differences exist on a continuum. So you would never be able to stop along the way and see that you know people on one side of the road are of one race and people on the other side of the road are of another race. And it's impossible to make stable categories within that continuum of, of appearance that everyone would agree on. Um, for another argument against the concept of, of race, the genetic variations that show up in someone's physical appearance, like the tone of their skin, for example, makes up 0.1% of a person's total genetic code, and it doesn't predict anything else about that person. So for that matter, a Russian may have more in common genetically with someone from Cameroon than they might with another person from Russia. Now, at the same time, population gene genetics can help us understand things like why certain medical conditions are more prevalent in some places than others, but still, those patterns don't give us stable racial categories. So for about a century, anthropologists have been convinced that race is not really a valid category, but this obsolete term still circulates in everyday language, in media reports, um, even on government census surveys. So let's start with everyday language. And when I teach this segment in person, I usually begin with a brief kind of brainstorming type activity, which uh, for the educators watching this, that's my hook for this part of the, the, the lesson, right? Um, I usually ask the group to make a list together of, of common ethno-racial categories that you hear in everyday speech 
at present. So I make it clear that I don't mean slurs or insults. I mean words that people use to describe someone's race or ethnicity that are socially acceptable in, in 2020. And the results often look something like this. Uh, common categories like black, white, Asian, South Asian, brown, Italian, Jamaican, indigenous, Chinese, Caucasian. These are chosen at random. I could go on and list lots more, but I think these are enough to, to make the point. So step one is this kind of brainstorm. List some common words that people use to describe race or ethnicity that are socially acceptable right now. And we usually get a list that looks something like this. Next step is I ask the group to take a closer look and think about what exactly these categories refer to. Are these ways of describing color or tone? Do they describe a nation or a country? Do they describe a region? Do they refer to something else? And so in, in this view, I, I've tried to color code them by what they refer to. So some of them like white, black, and brown, obviously those refer to color or like an approximation of different skin tones, I guess. Other terms refer directly to specific countries like Italian or Jamaican or Chinese. Uh, some of them refer to continents or to parts of continents like Asian and South Asian, for example. Uh, indigenous is a unique one. It refers to a relationship to place. So people who are indigenous to, to the land. And I'm not making light of this at all. That's a very crucial distinction. But the point for now is just that categori categories for defining race and or ethnicity are vague and inconsistent. So based on this one small sample, is it about skin tone? Is it about nationality? Is it about a relationship to a place? Is it about a region? And we haven't even gotten into the Caucasian category yet, which has a long, complex history that I don't have time to fully get into, but the short version is, it refers to a geographical region, like some of the others, in this case, the, the region where Eastern Europe meets Western Asia, basically. And now Caucasian is used to describe people who look something like me, whether or not that person has any actual connection to the Caucasus region. And it comes from the, that very old, obsolete idea I mentioned a little while ago, that there are three races of humans. Uh, one of them was a Caucasoid. So, like I said, those old ideas still show up in our everyday speech. And so Caucasian persists as a way to describe white people. But it sounds scientific, even though it's not, and for that reason it still gets used as a euphemism, or a, a mild-sounding kind of indirect word that's used to replace a more blunt word or to kind of soften reality, because talking critically about the white category or the concept of whiteness means talking about power and privilege, which can get uncomfortable for some white people, and so the term Caucasian basically gets used to, to protect their feelings, um, but more on that later. We'll come back to this two episodes from now, but racial categories often correlate with national identities in a vague but powerful and often dangerous way. So the AAA, the American Anthropological Association, has an excellent website called Understanding Race, which I've linked below. Um, it's, it's part of an effort to, to share anthropological knowledge with the general public. There are a few surveys and quizzes you can take. Um, they're all useful, but with regards to the point I'm making right now, I recommend when you have time playing the Who is White game. Um, it gives you a list of, of nationalities chosen seemingly at random, and you need to quickly answer whether people from that country are white or not white, or you can also pick not sure. Now, when I'm teaching this in a classroom, I usually put this up on the screen and I get people in the group to call out the answers as we go. Some of the answers are almost unanimous, others have the room split, which illustrates the point that the categories tend to be vague and nonsensical. So what I recommend doing is pausing this video and taking five minutes to play the Who is White game, which you can find through the Understanding Race link below. So people used to talk about race like it was interchangeable with nation. So the example I gave a bit earlier, um, the 19th century idea that there was a British race and that it was glorious and that it was destined to lead the world. Now, people are less likely to talk like that now, but there's still an idea that certain races come from certain places. And I think the who is white game illustrates how it's, it's not that simple. What's interesting to me is there was an earlier version of the website that used to include stats on how other people before you had answered those questions. 
And of course, it was unreliable data because, you know, anybody is free to take the quiz a hundred times, for example. I don't know why anybody would, but they might. So for that reason, it wasn't, you know, reliable, but it was still interesting. So to give a couple examples from that that I think were interesting, uh, I'm sure you noticed Canadians were one of the questions. And when we get to that one in my urban Canadian classroom, it's always quite obvious that Canadians are not a universally white group. But back when that website displayed the results of the survey, I remember it was about 80% of the people who took it had said that Canadians were white. Um, now, it's the American Anthropological Association, so you have to assume it was largely an American audience, but there's no way of knowing that just from the website. The point is, whoever took this survey, 80% of them think that Canadians are white and that it's that simple, I guess. Um, some other examples that came up... Uh, Spaniards, people from Spain, are largely considered white, for example, while Cubans are largely considered not white. But what about Cubans who can trace their family directly to Spain and who also would probably look white by Canadian standards? So we could say much the same thing about any other nationality, really, in Latin America. That's just one example that showed up on the survey. Um, another important point that the survey raises is that the idea of who is white changes over time. So in North America, for example, 140 years ago, the Irish were not considered white. Neither were people from Sweden or Finland. And, you know, in, in 2020, there's no question that people from those places would be seen as white in North America. Um, some other complications. The category of Italians, which was also on the survey, that, that's a complicated one. It's debatable as to when Italians in Canada started to be seen as white. And it's also debatable whether that applies to all Italians in the same way. So are Sicilians and Calabres white or just Northern Italians? It depends on who you ask and when. The standards change from place to place and across time. Um, Eastern Europeans were not considered white until well into the 20th century. And even then, Canadians of Western European ancestry would still continue to use racial slurs to describe Eastern Europeans sometimes. And this is still a question in other places. So in recent years, for example, there's been an upsurge of discrimination against Polish people living in England, for example. Um, another, it's, it's, it's also a good time to mention this. Many of the countries that are part of the Caucasus region that Caucasians apparently are named after are countries that are overwhelmingly considered not white. So, pretty clear example of how nonsensical the categories can be, I think. Um, but the next step is to connect all of this to some reality. And to do that, I want to quote from the author of the survey, who is a law professor named Vernelia Randall. And she writes, I created this survey to help show that we make judgments not only about who is white, but also what countries are white, or predominantly white, and to call attention to some of the questions that raises. For example, when someone who is not considered white is a citizen of a country that is considered white, that person is often perceived as a foreigner. And she gives the example of Japanese Americans, whose families in many cases have been in the United States for more generations than many white American families, but are still seen as outsiders. So that comes from an American website designed for an American audience. So I will add that we can say much the same thing, well, the exact same thing, rather, about Japanese Canadians in Canada. And then uh, Vernelia Randall concludes with what I think is the most crucial point on this uh, image, on this slide. She wrote, Our opinions about who is white and who is not can affect how we relate to one another. Race matters because discrimination based on perceived racial grouping continues to exist. So to repeat, race is not a legitimate concept, but racism is very real, and it's a systemic problem. What we mean by that is it's not just the negative opinion that someone has of someone else. It's not just an emotional issue or something that goes away if you just ignore it or be the bigger person, as is sometimes said. Um, and on the point that racism is about power and privilege, not just emotions or perceptions, I want to show you a model that's used mostly by sociologists and psychologists to understand the kind of biased thinking that can lead to discrimination but I think it also works in anthropology as well, so let's, let's take a look at that. Now, it's a model for understanding the relationship between stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. People often use these terms interchangeably, like, they, like they're the same thing. 
Um, like they're all just different words for bad feelings towards groups of people. They're closely related, but they're different in some important ways. So I'll start to describe them using some examples that aren't racism, and then we'll bring it back to the real example of racism. Stereotypes are generalizations about groups of people. Uh, the group can be defined based on anything, based on gender, ethnicity, ability, place of residence, etc., really anything. And any of us could hold stereotypical views about anyone else, about women, men, teenagers, the University of Toronto students, British people, people from a certain Canadian province, people from a certain city, older people, anything. Um, sometimes stereotypes are a positive judgment, but usually they're negative. Sometimes they're based on one experience or a few experiences uh, with the group or with the imagined group. Let me try to illustrate this with uh, a bit of a silly example that has nothing directly to do with racism, and then we'll bring it back to the reality of racism. So we're going to start with two stereotypical views that I've encountered in my life. Stereotype number one, students are liars. Okay. Stereotype number two, professors are jerks. And I mean, we could use foul language instead, but let's just keep it PG-13, I guess. We'll say professors are jerks. Um, we'll start with the first example. Students are liars. Now that is a stereotype that may be held by some professors. It's based on a biased perception that might be based on a real experience. Some students do lie. Some students um, copy and paste from Wikipedia and put that in their essays and say they wrote it. That's plagiarism. It's also a form of lying. Um, some students say they were sick during the test, but then you see them through the window of the of the student pub, you know, five minutes after the test was after the test ended. So that that happens. Um, that first stereotype: students are liars. Biased view based on potentially a real experience or two. Uh, same thing with the second example: professors are jerks. That's a stereotype held by some students. It's a biased perception that could be based on a real experience. Maybe that student who thinks the professors are jerks once had a professor who gave them low grades without justifying it or never responded to emails or just, I don't know, always seemed rude somehow. It's a biased perception based on a potentially real experience or two or, or three. Next step is prejudice, which is somewhat different from stereotyping and more of a problem. Now, the, the root word of prejudice is prejudge. So in other words, you make up your mind about a person or an entire group of people based on your stereotypical views of that group. Prejudice is deeper than perception. It's more than just a knee-jerk reaction to difference. It's, it becomes part of people's worldview. It's a feeling of superiority. If a professor was prejudiced against students, he or she would assume that every student is a liar. So every time they see an email from the student, they assume it's a, it's a false excuse or, I don't know, a fake doctor's note or something, or they assume that every essay is plagiarized. Um, that person will still reply to emails and will still grade assignments um, according to, you know, a universally accepted standard, but I guess they would do that with a kind of bad attitude. Um, or if a student was prejudiced against professors, to continue with the other stereotype that we're talking about, maybe they would assume that every professor is a jerk and begin every new course with a negative attitude. Now, the line between stereotype and prejudice is kind of blurry. Stereotype refers to the, the knee-jerk reaction, and prejudice refers to belief based on that reaction. Um, but, you know, in, in these two kind of silly examples to illustrate a serious point, it's possible for each of these beliefs that, you know, the one belief that students are liars, the other one that professors are jerks, it's possible for both of these beliefs to escalate to the point of prejudice. But the next step is discrimination, and there's a big difference between prejudice and discrimination, and this is the crucial difference. Discrimination is about behavior and actions, not just beliefs. So in the simplest terms, you could say it's prejudice plus power. It's when an individual or a group can act on prejudice in a way that blocks another group from accessing resources or privileges. So let's say our hypothetical professor strongly believes that students are liars and then starts to take action based on that belief. That could result in things like, um, you know, very strict and unrealistic deadlines or unfair grading or lack of communication. I mean, why bother replying to emails if the emails are just full of lies anyway, right? And the end result of that behavior can prevent members of other groups, well, in this case, students, can prevent them from gaining access to resources or privileges. So if the professor's prejudice belief 
influences their action that can result in unfairly low grades for students, which can bring down GPAs, which can make them ineligible for scholarships or grad programs, which can really affect future career plans. Um, those are tangible ways that that person's beliefs and actions directly harm others. Um, let's carry this through with our other hypothetical belief, the belief that professors are jerks. So let's say a student firmly believes that all professors are jerks to the point that it starts to influence how they treat professors. Um, what would those actions look like? I guess they could be rude in class, they could post negative reviews online, they could speak ill of professors, but what impact would that have on the professor's life? How would that limit the professor's life chances? Just try, try for a second and try to think of some ways in which that would do tangible harm to a professor. Exactly, nothing. There aren't really any ways that that could really harm a professor. Maybe in some very minor temporary ways, but the point is, for prejudice to become discrimination, there needs to be a power differential in place. Now, universities are unequal institutions in which professors have power over students, so they have the capacity to harm students by taking action on prejudicial beliefs. And we can say the same thing about any kind of educational context, I guess. I'm just starting with something close to home. Um, the other way around, students don't really have power over professors, so students can hold prejudicial beliefs about professors as much as they want, but there's no meaningful way to act on those beliefs and cause actual blasting harm. So again, it was just a silly example to illustrate a very serious real point, so let's get back to reality and racism. Systemic inequality is the product of generations of discriminatory actions by individuals and policies by institutions. And that's why inequality shows up in patterns, and those patterns are shaped by the same things that make up a person's identity, gender, sexuality, class, race or ethnicity, ability, and more. Racism is an example of discrimination, and it operates in much the same way as my silly hypothetical students and professors example. Anyone is cap capable of holding stereotypical perceptions and prejudiced beliefs about anyone else, but for those beliefs to cross over into discrimination, there needs to be a power differential. Now, in terms of racism, where does that power differential come from? Most social scientists will tell you that in a place like Canada, it's systemic. That means that it's built into our society and it's operating in the background of everything that happens here and often in the foreground, too. Um, there's been a lot of pushback and a lot of defensiveness to these ideas, especially in recent years. Um, some people get angry or defensive when you talk about power and privilege as if you're saying that, you know, all white people's lives are easy and they never had to work for anything or other side of the same coin that, you know, all black indigenous and people of color are like helpless victims or something. Now, no social scientist who talks about racism, power and privilege has ever said these things. These are distortions that come from how these ideas get taken up in, in the media and sometimes in pop culture and in everyday life. So to try to correct some of this, I've provided a link below to uh, an article from 1989 by Peggy McIntosh, which to me is a, it's a really good example of some of the early scholarship about the idea of, of white privilege, earlier scholarship, I should say. So the author, Peggy McIntosh, is a white American woman, and she breaks the idea of privilege down in, into very concrete terms it's by listing 46 things that she feels that white people in the United States, such as herself, could take for granted and that racialized people could not. And her argument is these 46 things add up to pretty significant privilege. So... If you struggle with the concept of white privilege, I recommend checking out that list of 46 things and thinking about whether or not those are things that you can take for granted in your life. Now, none of this means that every single person in, in sorry, that every single white person in Canada has it good and that everyone else has it bad. You know, obviously there are many examples like billionaires um, from racialized communities and, and white people living in poverty, for example, but at a national level, the stats show that race or ethnicity plays a key role in the patterns of inequality that shape Canadian society. So just some examples. To me, some of the most important parts of living a good life are not being poor and not being afraid of the police. And the stats show that ethnicity plays a major role in whether or not you will enjoy those privileges. Now, in the case of Canadian racism, 
This is a country built on the notion that the British Empire is a wonderful thing and that it deserves to take over new lands. And on top of that, the idea that when the British take control of someone else's territory, it's for their own good. Very few Canadians would, would speak these ideas today, but this was part of the foundation of, of how this country was set up. So on that point of colonialism being seen as good for the people being colonized, here's an image from a residential school. From the 1840s until the last one closed in 1996, these schools were run by various churches across Canada, and their purpose was to so-called civilize indigenous children by separating them from their families, often by force, and teaching them to assimilate to mainstream Canadian culture. In 2015, a government-appointed commission said that residential schools were an act of, quote, cultural genocide, or an effort to destroy the culture of a group of people. Slavery was legal in the British colonies that became Canada until 1833, when slavery was banned across most of the British Empire. Afterwards, it stayed legal in the United States until 1865, and in the years in between, it's, I think, somewhat well known that many people escaped slavery by traveling through what was known as the Underground Railroad into Canada. And largely as a result of that, I think many Americans in particular see Canada as a sort of safe haven for people fleeing racism. Now, it was to some extent, but life was not easy for formerly enslaved persons after arriving either. And it's an important story, but it's just one part of the story of how black communities made it into Canada before Canada was even a nation state. So it was big news a couple of years ago when our new $10 bill came into circulation. The bill features Viola Desmond, who was a black woman from Nova Scotia, who sat in the whites-only section of a Halifax movie theater in 1946. She was arrested, she spent a night in jail, and then continued fighting against segregation. And this image is her sister holding up the bill um, when it went into circulation in 2018. The, the bill also includes in the background an image of the north end of Halifax, which is where the arrest happened and where Viola Desmond lived. Also in the north end of Halifax once stood the community of Africville. Uh, this was one of many black communities in Nova Scotia with roots going back many generations. So some of their ancestors were enslaved and brought to the British colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries, including those that, that became Canada. Later on, there were the so-called black loyalists, uh, people who in the 1790s fought for the British against the American Revolution, basically in exchange for escaping slavery. Um, and something similar happened again during the War of 1812. There were also the Maroons, a community who had escaped slavery in Jamaica and were then deported by the British to Nova Scotia in 1796. Um, and one black Nova Scotian community in particular uh, this one, Africville, dates back to about the 1830s. This was a community on the outskirts of Halifax, on the North End, that existed for well over a century before people were coerced to leave it in the 1950s. Uh, people in Africville paid taxes, but they didn't have running water or paved roads. Um, by the 50s and 60s, there was this trend of urban renewal all over North American cities, which I'll say more about much later in the series when I talk about my, my own research on, on you know Canadian urban planning and politics. But anyway, the 50s and 60s, urban renewal all across North American cities. The idea that we should um, demolish informal settlements and so-called slums and rebuild them as, as modern housing complexes. Even if the people who live there don't want that, um, the thinking was it was for their own good, so it needs to be done anyway. So this thinking got applied to Africville, which was also exactly where the city of Halifax wanted to lay the foundation for a giant bridge across the water to Dartmouth. And the short version is people were forced to move, often with little or no compensation to make way for this, uh, this project. Many of them were relocated into newly constructed public housing projects. And it wasn't until 2010 that the city of Halifax officially apologized for the demolition of Africville. This came with some funding to create an Africville museum and to restore the Africville church and some other important initiatives, but nobody who was displaced got any individual compensation in the aftermath. Um, the image on the left side of, of the screen, that's the cover of a great documentary about Africville that I recommend, and I'll provide a link to it in the, in the description. 
Another example of Canadian racism, the head tax. There's a long history of anti-Chinese racism in Canada. So from 1885 to 1923, the federal government charged a very high so-called head tax to Chinese immigrants. And one of the aims of this was to prevent the families of Chinese workers who had built the railroads to prevent their families from also moving to Canada. Uh, so that was 1885 to 1923. And then Chinese immigration was banned entirely from 1923 to 1947. Another is the Japanese internment. During World War II, the federal government forced over 20,000 Japanese Canadians into prison camps like this one and seized their homes and property. Not that it should make a difference, but many were second or third generation born Canadians and those who were still alive in 1988 got a formal apology and about $18,000 in compensation from the Canadian government. Uh, the same thing had also happened in the United States to Americans of Japanese descent, and likewise, those who were still alive in 88 got a formal apology and about 20000 from the American government in, in compensation. This next example goes back to the idea of whiteness, and it's an example of how racial categories are blurry, they shift over time, they don't really make sense, but they're very powerful regardless. This slide is an image from Toronto's Corktown neighborhood in 1917. It's an area in the east end of downtown. It's still called Corktown, except now it's known for expensive real estate, nice restaurants, nice gardens. But when this photo was taken a little over 100 years ago, Corktown was seen as the wrong side of the tracks because Irish people live there. It's named after County Cork in Ireland, and it was called Corktown at a time when Irish people were not fully considered white in Canada. So many Irish had come to Canada after a terrible famine in the 1840s, and for decades they were seen as a different so-called race because they weren't British. So on this note, from what little I know about my own family history, apparently one of my great-grandfathers was brought to Canada from Ireland as a child in, in terrible circumstances, and he would have been a young man around the time that this photo was taken. But most scholars would say that by the middle of the 20th century, people of Irish descent had really become part of the Canadian mainstream, and nowadays, you know, most if not everybody would consider people of Irish descent white. So as a result, there still are stereotypes and, you know, stupid jokes that you hear about the Irish stuff about St. Patrick's Day or, or being drunk or having a bad temper or something. But these jokes don't have the potential to injure someone's life in the way that jokes and stereotypes about black, indigenous, and people of color do. The same can be said of other European ethnic groups, such as Italians and Scandinavians, groups that were seen as different so-called races before, are now seen as white and don't face the sorts of discrimination that their ancestors did. And this is part of what the anthropologist Eva Mackey, um, I'll say more about her work in a couple of episodes, part of what Eva Mackey means when she calls whiteness a, an, an unmarked normality in Canada. Um, She's a Canadian anthropologist who studies race and ethnicity in Canada, and she's critical of Canadian multiculturalism. She makes the point that few people ever even really try to define what white is or have you know a, a reliable list of things that, that make you white. In Canada, it just means not multicultural or not immigrant, and being able to fit into that category comes with a lot of privilege in Canada. But I'll save most of that for episode 10 on Canadian nationalism because that one will, will tie together a lot of this episode and the next two. Um, next episode is on gender and sexuality. Episode 9 covers nationality. And what we're doing with these is piecing together this idea of intersectionality. These are all aspects of identity, and they're also dimensions of social inequality. And the idea is to think through everyday life or to make sense of a changing world. We need to be thinking about all of these things at the same time. So, for example, people of the same ethnicity could have very different experiences based on their different genders, for example. Or people of the same class could lead very different lives based on their ethnicity, but they still have something in common. They, they have class in common. Last point I'll make on this, I didn't say much about the idea of ethnicity, a sense of historical, cultural, and sometimes ancestral connection to a group of people who are imagined to be distinct from those outside the group. I'll say more about this in the episode about Canadian nationalism, but for now, I'll just add that um, I think anyway, in everyday speech, when people talk about race, 
they are usually referring to something more like this idea of ethnicity, which is not a perfect term either, but it's sort of, you know, the, the, the best we have to work with at the moment, maybe, because it describes these differences that do exist and that do matter and affect our experiences, but it does so in a way that is, I think, more oriented towards the idea of community. Um, you know, it refers to a sense of historical culture, cultural ancestral connection. Um, it doesn't imply that these differences or these boundaries or communities are, are like um, carved in stone or part of our, our, our biology and, and it just can't be transgressed. So it's more fluid. Um, potentially more more open, more creative, but also potentially dangerous, and I'll say more about this in Canadian Nationalism Week. Um, so that's it for now on race and ethnicity. I think I'll show the, the credits and the works cited page, and then I'll come back for a very brief um, revisiting of what I said last episode about class, the emic and etic class stuff. If you have time to do that exercise, or if you're just interested, I'll get into that after the, the, the credits. Thank you. Last episode. Remember, the emic is the insider view, the cultural perspective that the anthropologist is is trying to understand, and the etic is the outsider view, the, the framework that the anthropologist uses to interpret these things. So, in the case of this class exercise, remember, I asked you to go through this list of occupations and decide what class this occupation belongs to, using whatever categories come to mind. So is this a working class job, a middle class job, does it make you a member of the elite, the upper class, or the lower class, etc.? That's the emic, because you make those distinctions based on your own experiences, your perspectives, and using the vocabulary you grew up with. The etic is the theory I showed you in the last episode, the Marxist theory of how capitalism works and how the classes fit into it. And in that theory, a very small sector of society, the capitalist class, they own the means of production and everybody else gets by by selling their labor to the owners of the means of production. And that vast majority of society, that's the working class. Now, there's no consensus on this point, you know, in anthropology or anywhere else, of course. Um... But the, you know, most anthropologists who do talk about class tend to talk about it using some kind of variation on, on this framework. Um, but one point that's often made is that in everyday language and in, in mass culture in, in Canada, people often don't work with that framework very much, right? No, nobody really thinks about class through this Marxist lens. I mean, some people do, but it's, it's uncommon in Canada, it's often said. But people are well aware that some jobs pay more than others, and some jobs get you more respect than others. And so people have a vocabulary for describing that and for situating themselves within it. So what that usually looks like in Canada is most people say most of these jobs are middle class jobs. Um, a lot of people don't know what the working class really is and tend to think that basically anybody who has a job is at least middle class and anybody below that is just broke or poor or a member of the lower class or something like that. For example, the squeegee kid is one of the lists, uh, one of the occupations listed on here. That's a bit of 90s slang, perhaps, that might be unfamiliar. Um, also, if any Americans happen to be watching, I didn't know this until recently, apparently squeegee is a Canadian-only word. It's it's a window washer, so it's uh, you use a squeegee to wash windows. So a squeegee kid is somebody who washes windows um, at red lights for tips. They wash car windows when cars are stopped at red lights for cash. Uh, this has been illegal in Ontario since 1999, but it's still done sometimes, of course. Now, most people say that that occupation, that's a lower-class job or lower-class pursuit once i explain what it is it's not a real job it's it's just doing something that's officially illegal to try to get some cash to get by um then there are jobs like the bartender like the barista like the taxi driver uh many people in my classes say those are, are middle class jobs but in terms of the etic those are quite clearly working class jobs those are people selling their labor in time-based increments to get by even the bank branch manager. Many of us would say that's a middle-class job. They're not on, you know, the board of directors of the whole bank. 
Uh, but they're responsible for a branch and they're the boss of a bunch of people. So maybe they're somewhere in the middle, right? Now, there's a huge theoretical debate around that point that's beyond the scope of this course. But according to the framework I showed you in the last episode, that person is still really a member of the working class. They're still selling their labor. Uh, they're just getting more for that labor than the tellers or the, the cleaners are. Basically, what this boils down to is, in the etic, in that Marxist framework I showed you last episode, what really de- determines your class is your relationship to the means of production. If you own or control the means of production, you're in the capitalist class. That's the, the bank CEO, that's the CEO of Amazon. Everybody else on that list, for the most part, is, is working class, no matter how much money they make. So even I've I've even read some pieces by Marxist thinkers who say that the baseball player, let's say we're talking about a millionaire pro athlete, really that person is still a member of the working class, just a really well paid one. And so pro athletes have unions for the same reason that less wealthy workers have unions, so they can collectively push for a bigger slice of the pie in opposition to the owners. Even though um, it's you know multi million dollars worth of salary at stake as opposed to you know a very incremental wage increase for, for less, lesser paid workers structurally, it's still the same dynamic really. Um, some people define class largely with regards to prestige and respect. So now we're getting back to the emic. So lawyer and uh, hilariously professor usually get named as middle class jobs, but sometimes some of my students put these in the upper class category on the basis that people tend to respect these professions, I guess. Which is funny, because these professions certainly don't guarantee you a high income. Um, Obviously, some people in them do quite well, do extremely well, in fact. But, you know, ask a recent law school grad what the job market is like, or ask me about what it's like being contract faculty. Like many other workers, it involves reapplying for your job every year and hoping you end up with enough work to get through that year. Which leads us to the idea of the gig economy, as represented on this slide by the Uber driver, who increasingly is replacing the taxi driver. So some newer theories even go as far to say that this is a new class in and of itself, the, the precariat, which comes from uh, the, you know, the, the, the word precarious for precarious labor, or working in very unstable, unreliable conditions. We'll talk more about that in the episodes coming up on globalization and neoliberalism. Anyway, there are many, many other ways to look at all of this. Uh, That was just some of them, some of the categories. You can make up your own mind about the idea that, you know, almost everyone is working class. But just as one takeaway, I do encourage you to think a bit more critically or carefully about what the middle class is and what makes you middle class as opposed to working class. So I'll wrap there. Thanks for your attention.